great to be here. Today I'm going to talk about innovation. And we're going to talk about innovation, how it relates to software startups, or any kind of startup. My main passion has to do with the intersection of technology and innovation. What happens at that intersection is disruption. And what do I mean by disruption? It's a fancy word sometimes. What I mean by, dis by disruption is a brand new startup eliminating the business model, eliminating and putting out of business practically a company that has had a monopoly for 100 years. Take Skype, for example. No one at the phone company would have invented Skype. <laughs> right? Only a startup can invent Skype. So my theory is that the majority of the world's innovation today comes from people like you and me. People that want to change the world, that are willing to start their own business or go work at an early stage company. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Startups are very expensive. Back when I was your age, 20 years ago, Startups cost approximately 20 million US dollars to get from the idea on paper, the business plan, to the first paying customer. That means if every single person in this room wanted to start their own business, had an idea like Skype, an idea that can destroy an entrenched monopoly, an idea that can change the world, if everyone in this room had that idea, there's only a limited amount of capital to go around. Maybe one of you would get funded with that $20 million. The rest of those ideas probably never would never be brought to market. In addition, the people who make these investments of $20 million US dollars are taking one big risk on one of you. What if it was the wrong one? The chances of failure are high in a startup. But when you invest in only one idea, the problem is there's a lot of risk. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. I spent most of my adult life at startups. And in 1999, I co-founded a company. And it cost us approximately half of what it did just earlier that decade. In 1999, it took us 10 million US dollars of investment to get from the idea on paper to the first paying customer. Did another business in 2002, and it took us only 350,000 US dollars to get from idea to the first paying customer. You can see, drastically gone down. If we were thinking about that $20 million just maybe you know, 10 years prior, now with $350,000, more of you in the room would get funded. Probably about eight of you would get funded at that price point. Bringing eight new ideas to market, far less risk for the investment community. They're spreading their capital around, multiple ideas. In 2007, I started another business. This business cost us only 100,000 US dollars. Same thing. If this was just a few years prior, less people would get funded. When the startups are cheaper to bring to market, you have far more ideas, far more innovation, far more disruption. In 2011, started another business right here in Hong Kong. Cost $25,000, and that's actually a lie. That's just what us founders put in. I don't even know how much of that we spent, but we spent a little less than the $25,000 again from the idea on the business plan to bring that to market to the first paying customer. And lastly, as part of the introduction, they said that I'm part of the Accelerator Hong Kong program, which I was a co-founder of, where we invest in six companies. Six companies come to Hong Kong. Well, actually, three were from Hong Kong, three came from overseas. And we invested 15,000 US dollars in each company and put them through a three-month program to accelerate their process and help them bring their products to market faster. They started their businesses with 15,000 US dollars. Most of them get it. 
from the idea to their product in just $15,000. So you're probably thinking, why? Has there been you know, a massive inflation? Like, what, what's the reason? Why, why is this the case? Mostly technology has had a, pl a play for this. There's a concept of cloud computing. If, you, if you're not an engineer or not a technical person, Gmail is cloud computing. The ability to put your hardware and have it be managed by someone else. You probably hear the buzzword cloud computing all the time, but I'll boil it down in layman's terms. In 1999, when I started that company and I had to spend $10 million, I had to buy racks and racks and racks of servers. You see it on TV all the time when they go into the big server room and the geeks are hitting all the buttons and the servers light up. It's all fake, by the way. <laughs> you would not be able to hear somebody in one of those server rooms. The fans are so loud, everyone wears earplugs. But yet, you know, you have romances, you have spies, they're all in those big server rooms. <laughs> So in 1999, to get my business off the ground, I had to buy lots of those servers. I had to buy lots of those fans. I couldn't even have the building's fire extinguishers working in that room, because what would happen? Uh, water, server, bad idea. We had to get these special foam things that cost lots and lots of money. I had to hire really expensive server maintenance people to take care of these servers for me. The list goes on. I spent tons and tons of money. Today, that's replaced. What cloud computing does is allows you to outsource that to Amazon, to Microsoft, to Google, to Rackspace, SoftLayer, all these companies that have cloud computing. And you pay for what you use. So I had to make a huge capital investment. Of, of that 10 million, maybe 2 million was on the servers, even though I didn't need all the capacity of those servers up front. With cloud computing, you might start off with your business paying a few hundred dollars a month or less. Especially since all of these companies are trying to attract startups that will give you your first six to nine months for free. Cloud computing has also spawned some other great innovations, such as Skype. Giving you the ability to work with talent all over the world, talk to customers, suppliers all over the world for free. And then, of course, the internet has made things like outsourcing using lower wage, lower wage employees or just employees that choose to live in other parts of the world. You don't have to spend a lot of money on offices. All of these pressures combined with the recessions that we've had in the last 10 years. Recessions are really great for starting a business. Trust me on that. There's lots of people looking for work and lots of people willing to work at a startup. So having a cheaper way of starting a business means, I'm going to do these all fast since we're having problems. Making your startup a lot cheaper to get from idea to paying customer changes the rules drastically. One of the most important things is that you now validate what you're going to build with potential customers before you actually build it. So not only is it cheaper, it's less risky, meaning 20 years ago, when it cost 20 million US dollars to bring a startup to market, you would just go build it and then hand it off to the customers and hope and pray that you built the right thing. Hope and pray that it works well. Now, you actually build rapid prototypes in the matter of days and give that to customers, judge their behavior, measure what they're doing, take that feedback and then build it into the next the next prototype, get some validated learning. After a few months, you may determine that there is no business here and you'll exit completely. That's why accelerators such as mine and all accelerators around the world work for three months. We've determined that that's about the amount of time that it takes to validate your business. In addition, it's far less risky to start a business than it was even five years ago, both financially and both personally. It's also far riskier, I'm sorry, it's also far less riskier for an investor to make an investment in your company. They don't have to spend $20 million to get from idea to paying customer. It still may take $20 million to build your business to go compete with Amazon and Google and Apple and Microsoft. But that $20 million is a far less risky investment after you already have paying customers, where in the past, 
that $20 million was used to build your product, to take that idea to market. So it's changed the game of entrepreneurship and investors. So what does this mean for you? Well, if you wanted to start a business, we heard in some of the last presentations, I think some bad words were used about your parents. I understand that. I live in Hong Kong. And it's not just parents in Hong Kong, by the way. My mom still tells me I should get a real job. I'm like, Mom, come on. I sold a company to Google. She goes, ah, that doesn't mean anything. You should be like your sister. So I get it. However, what did I just tell you? It's really cheap. It's really fast. You can start a business during your summer when you graduate before you go get the job in September. If that business has paying customers before you go on those job interviews, just don't go on those job interviews. <laughs> Mom and dad still might be pretty pissed. <laughs> but at least you're not selling them an idea and saying, oh, I'm going to go raise $20 million. I have a one in you know, 500 chance of, of raising the $20 million. Or you could say, I'll work on this just for a, few, you know, for a short amount of time, and we'll make a decision together if I can you know, move forward with this business. In addition to you, there's lots of unemployed people out there. Lots of people with multiple degrees. Well, I say instead of putting up a sign saying we'll work for food, I'm sure this was probably staged. Why wouldn't someone who's interested in a startup take a risk at a startup? They just were laid off from HSBC, 30,000 layoffs. So do they want to go to Standard Charter and face the same fate in two years? You know, startups used to be risky. And the number one reason why we don't go to startups is because we're afraid the startup might fail in a year or two. Well, the recession has changed that. The average person in the workforce is now more likely to go join a startup than they were before the financial crisis. In addition, an unemployed person can start working at a startup. It's so cheap. While they're still looking for a job. Same thing with you and mom and dad. There's no reason to do the same, to do both. You can look for a job and be on the unemployment line and interviewing for new jobs and take the one that comes better. Also, there's a lot of capital from the government, from universities, from grants, public-private partnerships that usually have some form of a competition. This is a picture of me when I went to business school and I won the business plan competition. And what they did is they wrote one big check. When I mean a big check, it was a big check. <laughs> Side story is that one big check, uh, we went out drinking heavily after the uh, victory ceremony. We were pretty surprised. We got the big check and we went to a bar and we stood in front of the bar and said, big check, and started inviting people to come into the bar with us. And then we forgot the big check at the bar when we left. <laughs> True story. Uh, this being recorded, I probably should have admitted that in public. Don't tell anyone. Uh, at least don't tell Merrill Lynch, who sponsored the interview. <laughs> but we got it back. We got it back. So instead of giving one big check at these competitions, at these grants, why not have spread that money around multiple teams, multiple startups, multiple groups, increasing the amount of potential for innovation and disruptive technology, increasing the amount of people that could actually start to have new jobs, and decreasing the risk. The university or, or Merrill Lynch took one big risk on us. However, what if we were the wrong team? What if we failed? They could have spread that across five teams and lowered their risk while simultaneously increasing the amount of innovation. So if you want to change the world, and you love innovation the way I do, how can we change Hong Kong in order to support this? The world has changed, now Hong Kong needs to change. I ran this accelerator, so I was simultaneously a part of six startups over the last few months. 
And I have to tell you, working in Hong Kong with a startup was painful. This is a banker town. Walk around Queens Road Central around 2.30 any weekday afternoon. All you do is buy, sell, buy, sell, bond, stocks, derivatives. I went to business school and I know what all that crap is, it's boring. <laughs> My wife is in private equity. I tell her all you do is move other people's money around. You're not actually you know, helping the world. Like, <laughs> like, I tell her every day. The, the bankers claim that they're you know, providing access to capital to those that don't need it. Uh, yeah, AKA rich people. Right? <laughs> I tell her she should quit her job and go into microfinance in Africa or something. She really loves finance and wants to help people. So Hong Kong lawyers, real estate, everything is ridiculously expensive and they don't understand how startups operate. We have no money in the beginning. We can't afford the deposits for the lawyers, the deposits for the legal fees. It's super simple to incorporate a business in Hong Kong. I had a team from Mexico come over to the accelerator. They incorporated a business here in Hong Kong, cost about 100 US dollars. Then they went to HSBC and tried to you know, open a bank account. I'll just tell you this, they're back in Mexico, they gave up, they opened a bank account there. Because they wanted capital requirements, proof of this, proof of that. They didn't understand what we were trying to do. My lawyers would have no idea what we were trying to do here in Hong Kong. That was writing the, the, the agreements for the employees and the things like that. So Hong Kong culture has to get with it. The world has changed. Startups are going to contribute to the economy in massive ways, disrupt innovation. Hong Kong has to change, but it starts at home. Mom and dad. Now I know mom and dad aren't here. But it does start at home. We do have to change the culture of Hong Kong. And lastly, how do we do that? How do we convince mom and dad? Well, we all know the story of this guy, Mark Zuckerberg. So what we need to get rid of the tiger moms, to get rid of the bankers, to make HSBC not piss me off so much, <laughs> what we need is a Mark Zuckerberg right here from Hong Kong. And maybe it could be you. Thank you very much.